basically, you know, I, you know, I've been into uh, music and records ever since I was a very small child. My, you know, my dad was a jazz, uh, a sort of a jazz uh, fan back in Los Angeles in the 1930s, sort of, uh, you know, uh, and he had he had all of these. Um, LP reissues of music from like the 20s and 30s. So I literally grew up with the classic Armstrong material, Benny Goodman. The first live concert I ever went to when I was about seven years old, my parents took me to go see Benny Goodman. It was an afternoon concert at the Shrine Auditorium. This would have been about 1956. So yeah, so I grew up my father was a big jazz fan who had, um, who had, you know, the uh, all these, you know, in the early 1950s, the record companies in America started reissuing stuff on on the LPs. When the LPs came out, they started reissuing, um, you know, all the kind of 20s, 30s music. And my dad bought those LPs. This is now in the early 1950s. So I grew up and I was right from the get go. I was just totally, totally into it. You know, I mean, I knew all of it. When I was like four or five years old, I could tell you about Fats Waller, you know. So, so, and then, you know, eventually um, when I was about, I suppose about 12 or 13, then I started buying my own records. And I was, became a very, almost immediately, I was like a deep record collector. You know, I would go to charity shops and find old records in addition to going to the, you know, buying the new stuff as well. And then also when I was about 10 years old, I discovered pop music radio in LA. And you know, back in those days, radio was um, much more diverse in content because you know, unlike the situation today where it's like these corporates that have these set playlists, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the DJs in those days, you know, used to just play things that they wanted to hear. And so, you know, I was exposed from about 10 years old to a very, very wide variety of music. You know, you used to actually get, you'd get like Cajun music on, on pop music radio in the sort of late 50s, early 60s. So. Yeah, so I mean, I've always been extremely music centric right from the get go. And you know, I have to say again, um, you know, my father was incredibly indulgent. I mean, from the time I was like four or five years old, he was quite happy to let me go and play his records. <laughs> so, you know, uh, that's always been the, so then my, my other fanaticism, I have two fanaticisms, one's music, the other one is railroads or railways. And in particular, this became a sort of an obsession with uh, steam locomotives. Now, I was unfortunate in as much as when I was growing up, the era of steam locomotives was already gone. Uh, basically, you know, the, the railroads in America, when I grew up, had already dieselized, but I just had this thing about steam. So, I got out of college, I got out of university in 1970, and I immediately, <laughs> I immediately went to work uh, for the railroad in, in America. And um, as it happened, in 1970, I, I had become aware of the fact that in South Africa, South Africa was like, from the, from the standpoint of like steam locomotives was like the US had been basically in the sort of 19, late 40s, early 50s. They were, the railways here were transitioning to both electric and diesel. But you know, when I finally managed to get the time and the money to come here on a visit, which was in January of 74, at that time, there were still, there was something like 2,000 steam locomotives um, uh, in daily service in this country. And on that trip, I discovered, hey, you know something? It's actually possible for me to come here and work on a real 
steam locomotive and a real, not a tourist train, but the real thing. So, uh, you know, I, I uh, took a six, in 75, middle of 75, I took a six month leave of absence from my railroad job in America. I was working for an outfit called the, the Southern Pacific. And I came out here and got a job as a fireman, a stuaker, uh, you know, for what was then the South African Railways and Harbors, St. Afrikaansa, Spurweg and Havens. And I'd only intended to be here for six months, but here I am all these years later. So I didn't come here for music, but because I was already in you know, a record collector and deeply curious, not only about what was happening contemporarily, but I was also deeply invested in musical history, you know. Uh, so, you know, as much as I was a fan of, you know, and going to concerts by you with the Stones and the Grateful Dead, at the same time, I was buying records on auction of 1920s and 30s, jazz material, blues, Cajun, gospel, country. So I came here and almost immediately I started, you know, because when I came here I knew nothing about South African music. And at first it was kind of saying, well, let me just pick up some records. Let me go to charity shops and get some 78s. And is there anything in South Africa, in South African music that interests me? And I just started finding all this stuff that I thought, wow, this music is fantastic. And of course, the thing about it is, is I could immediately relate to it because it was so heavily influenced by American music. So, you know, the Afrikaans music that I was picking up from the like 30s and 40s and 50s on 78s, you know, I mean, I could immediately make the connection with American country music. When it came to the, the you know, the, the, the African music, you know, what, what in those days we used to call Zulu <coughs> traditional, but is now known as Masconda. I mean, hey, you know, these are guys playing, singing and playing with acoustic guitar accompaniments. It's, I mean, it's like something like listening to a Mississippi blues player who recorded in the 1930s or something. So I can immediately make those connections. And the other thing that struck me was that the, um, we're now we're talking about sort of the late 70s, early 80s. You know, when I tried to find written information to tell me who were these artists, what were these record companies, when was this stuff recorded? All those kind of questions that as a music historian, albeit an amateur one, I, there was just no information. So I resolved, in addition to continuing to go out and, you know, I used to go out, I would go out and I would buy old store stocks. I would buy, I'd go to like a, you know, a, uh, what had once been a bicycle shop or something that would have, they'd have a couple hundred or maybe even a couple thousand, you know, dead stock records. And I would just buy the whole lot just because I was curious. I was curious to know, I mean, it was, you know, I was just deeply curious to know all about this stuff. But, and also that was the way to discover it. I mean, you couldn't turn on the radio and listen to it. So, so that's how it started. And, you know, by the mid, by the mid eighties, I actually, I, I, I quit my initial railway job in 79. And then I had about a, you know, it was about a six or seven year stint where I was in the film industry. Um, and I used that time not only to expand my collecting, but you know, for example, I went to the uh, I went to the Joburg Public Library, and I started doing newspaper searches, and I looked through all the drum magazines and all the zonk magazines, just trying to put together, you know, an idea of the history of how South African music had had, had developed, and you know, discovering who these people were, and then of course I started. You know, even, you know, even at that time, I started meeting my first South African uh, 
uh, musicians. One of, the first South African musician I met was a guy named Les Kelly, who was a bass player and had been involved with, with music starting in the early 1930s and you know, well, you know, well into the 1960s, Les was, was still you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, both performing and doing, doing sessions. So he was my first contact and then that kind of led to other people, you know. So that's how, yeah, that's how it all started. And then, then the other, I guess you might say the other development was that um, um, I was asked by a American record company called Rounder to, they came to me and they, and they said, listen, uh, we understand um, from uh, some mutual contacts that, the, that they had and I had in the, in the U.S., part of the collector circuit there. They say, oh, well, we understand, you know, you've got quite a big collection of South African music. Put together a compilation. Uh, this was, of course, back in LP day, you know, uh, vinyl days. Put together, put together a compilation. Anything you want to do, and you put that compilation together for us. So I put together this compilation. It was basically a history of, of Muskanda. It was called Singing in an Open Space, and it traced the roots of Muskanda from, you know, uh, just a single vocalist accompanying himself with an acoustic guitar to, you know, the later, the later productions where, you know, more and more instrumentation and backing voices, you know, basically where Bakanga was being mixed into, the, in, into, into Muskanda. So I put this thing out and of course part of the gig was that I had to, um, I had to, uh, you know, take care of the legal aspects and that led me I, I, I ch what I did to put this compilation together, I just pulled out 16 of my favorite Zulu traditional tracks. And, and, and then I had to go and find out who owned this stuff so that I could get, I could effect a license so that Rounder Records could license this stuff from the South African owners. And it turned out that although this stuff had come out on a whole variety of labels, that something like, I think 13 out of the 16 tracks were actually owned by Gallo. So that's how I made the Gallo connection. And then eventually, um, it was actually the, the man that ran the publishing company at Gallo said, listen, it's quite obvious that you know far more about all of this stuff that Gallo owns than anybody that works here now, come and, you know, come and work for Gallo. I'll create a post for you as a company archivist, or, you know, I was officially the archive manager. And that's, that was in 1990. So that's how, that's how, uh, that's how it started. And of course, the, I mean, that turned out to be a, a fantastic job because, you know, all of a sudden, all of these, all of these people whose records I had collected were walking into my office where, where you know, uh, obviously they appreciated that, you know, here's this bloody Mlungu from America who loves our music, which was pretty unusual <laughs> at the time. But, but um, you know, from my standpoint, you know, this again just, you know, uh, helped me you know, because I've all, one of the things I've always been obsessed about uh, is tracing who were the people that were actually playing on these recordings. You know, okay, you've got a, you got a record by Isintoma Zamoya. Well, who are these people, you know? So all of a sudden, you know, I've got the, you know, like Jack LaRolle, for example, was very involved with Isintoma Zamoya. So, you know, he was actually able to tell me, oh yeah, no, well that's so-and-so singing lead and that's who's playing bass, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's how the whole, the whole sort of knowledge thing started, yeah. Uh, well, with Dorothy, Dorothy was quite an interesting situation because I think I mentioned that I, you know, I worked in the film industry in the 80s. I was a clapper loader. <laughs> 
um, you know, sort of a third, second assistant cameraman, basically. And um, I got a gig to work on this film uh, in Zimbabwe. And we were up in, uh, in Zimbabwe for, oh, it was about 13 or 14 weeks, most of the time in, in Harare. And on, on the film crew, although it was partly South African, we also had, you know, uh, Zimbabweans that were working there. And I don't know, somehow I must have, I had no idea that Dorothy Masuka, I had, n I had no knowledge of who she actually was. I just had all of these records that I loved that she'd made on Troubadour in the 1950s. But apparently, I guess I can't remember how it happened, but somebody on the film crew I must have talked about Dorothy, but oh, Dorothy Masuka, oh yeah, no, 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 no. And sure enough, I mean, Dorothy at that time, this was about, what, 1983 or four? She was living in Harare. She was still performing. She was performing with an outfit called Jobs Combination at the time. And yeah, I arranged, we, we were, the film crew was staying at, I think it was the Intercontinental or, you know, one of those, one of the major hotels in Harare. And yeah, uh, I, uh, one of the, people in the film crew, you know, uh, brought her, brought her over and yeah, we had, we ended up having, having tea and a discussion with her and uh, I said, wow, I mean, are you the same woman who made all those records for Troubadour? Oh yes, that's me, you know. And then, so this was like, you know, so a, then after I went to work for Gallo in 90, so this would have been, I don't know what, eight or nine years later, I had a, you know, my, my dearest colleague at Gallo was Albert Rolulimi, um, who had been himself, you know, he was a penny whistle, record, uh, you know, recorded penny whistle, became a major sax, sax jive artist. You know, his, his most famous pseudonym was Kid Morongrong. Anyway, he would quit music as a professional and gone to work for the Gallo, for Gallo Music Publishers, I don't know, sometime in the 80s, I guess. And um, so, uh, you know, he was my, my, closest, my closest colleague. You know, we became great, great friends, both, you know, uh, you know professionally and, and personally. And so uh, he came to me one day and he said, listen, I've just gotten a letter from Dorothy Masuka who's asking us, is there any way we can get her back legally into South Africa. Now this must have been, I think this was probably about 1991. You know, she had basically been forced, she'd been persona non grata ever since she'd had to leave South Africa in about 60, 60 or 61. You know, she recorded this very inflammatory song about Lumumba. And, um, and uh, as it happened, when the record came out, um, she was she was visiting her her mother in Bulawayo, and the record company told her, "Listen, it's inadvisable for you to come back to South Africa." Anyway, so so she had been you know she'd been out of South Africa, wanted to come back. So I said, "Okay, fine." And so what I did, I you know wrote a letter using obviously the official Gallo letterhead and signing it as the archive manager. Just, uh, you know, I sent a, like a letter to the Home Affairs Department, I guess it would have been, yeah. And just explaining what the situation was and saying that, you know, we were, you know, interested in having this, you know, this artist come back into the country and yeah, they, they gave permission. And yeah, I mean, I still remember, you know, you know, we got, uh, you know, she came down by bus and, and, um, yeah, Albert and I went down to to pick her up, and there she there she was back back in South Africa after thirty years or something. Yeah, <laughs> and then of course I you know I tell until she until she passed away. I was you know I knew Dorothy very very well. We were we were we were great friends. Just to you know to start off, consider the recording industry and how it started. Basically, Thomas Edison in 1877 patented the first, uh, the first 
method of recording. He was re recording on cylinders, but he never did anything with it from a commercial standpoint. Um, it was only in 1889 that the first commercial record company, which was called North American Phonograph Company and was a predecessor to the Columbia label. So <clears throat> while, while, you know, Edison never did anything, at least initially commercially, with his invention of the first, you know, practical method to record, to record sound. Uh, in 1889, a company called North American Phonograph Company set up. They were the first, com they were the first company set up to make commercial recordings. Thereafter, through the 1890s, this recording industry developed with other companies getting into the game and it becoming quite internationalized. By 1900, um, it, what had started out as in a sort of a, an American-centered industry was basically had already gone to Europe and the UK and, and even to the point that, you know, records were being made by mobile recording units in India and China and so forth. So it was already becoming quite internationalized, albeit not in Africa. So the, the, one of the most important of the early uh, recording companies was an outfit called Victor Talking Machine. And basically, they were, they were, their operations were based around the patent that was created by a guy named Emil Berliner to make not cylinder recordings, but flat disc recordings. So Victor Talking Machine started up, and then they had a sister company in England called the Gramophone Record Company. And the Gramophone Record Company ended up being quite uh, a major player in terms of early development of recordings in South Africa. So as far as South Africa in particular was concerned, already by, certainly by the late 1890s, you started getting records being imported into South Africa. And, and the, the, the situation would usually be, and this was specifically the case with the Gramophone Record Company, is that they would have a local agent who basically had a monopoly for, in, for you know, bringing their records into South Africa. And in the case here with the Gramophone Record Company, it was an outfit called Mackay Brothers. Mackay Brothers had started up in Cape Town in the late 1890s. And of course, you know, bringing Gramophone Record Company records into South Africa was just a small part of their business. They were dealing in, you know, they were retailers of musical instruments and also, of course, very critically, sheet music. Sheet music was a giant in part of the, uh, you know, the commercial music industry, basically up through at least the 19, the 1920s, far more than, far more important than records, actually. So, and, you know, in, ter in terms of, you know, the overall percentage of w where their money was coming in food. Sheet music was much bigger than recordings. So starting, starting in, in the first decade of the last century, Mackay Brothers, in conjunction with, with uh, Gramophone Record Company in England, for whom they were the sole agents, Gramophone Record Company started recording South African artists in England. So the first artist, to, artist you might say, to record, this was now May 1906, was Johannes J. Smith, who recorded two spoken word recordings in Afrikaans for Gramophone Record Company. That was the first South African to record. Then in October, 1906, the Springbok rugby team, the first Springbok rugby team, went on tour in England under, uh, it was led by this guy Paul Ruess, whose son later became the, the head of the SABC in Samro, but that's a, was a much later development. But anyway, <laughs> so Paul Ruess's Springbok rugby span made four recordings. Three of them spoken word, 
one of them singing. So you can say that the Springbok rugby team were the first South African musicians to actually make a record. The first Africans to make a commercial recording, um, well, they weren't actually, they were Swazis. They were, there, were, there were four Swazi chiefs in 1907 that went to the UK to petition the British government to keep Swaziland out of the four upcoming Union of South Africa. They made four recordings, three of which are spoken, one of which they are singing. Um, I've never actually heard those recordings. But anyway, I can tell from, I know the titles. So it appears that, so you can say that those Swazi chiefs were the first African musicians to make, to make a recording, at least from Southern Africa. So thereafter, for, for the next several years, again, this would have been in conjunction with Mackay Brothers undoubtedly recommending local musicians to record for a gramophone record company in England. So you had this steady stream of South African artists going to make records for gramophone record company. Then the next very seminal event was that in 1912, Mackay Brothers got the gramophone record company to come here with a, with a mobile recording unit. And those were the first records they were actually made on South African soil. They made about 1,500 recordings. They recorded both in Cape Town and in, and in Johannesburg. Um, Afrikaans material, although from a musical standpoint, very, very disappointing in as much as it was all, it was all church music. So it was just like, it was just like these groups singing singing and you know hymns and Afrikaans. Not very interesting from a musical standpoint, but there were some incredibly interesting recordings that were made of various African indigenous groups. Both, you know, um, probably probably people that probably people that were recruited from the mines. Um, because some of them some they 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 not only were there were there were Kosa recordings made, but there were also Chopi Chopi recordings made, and those Chopis undoubtedly were were only in Johannesburg because they were here working in the mines. So okay, so that's 1912, and 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 incidentally, the Gramophone Record Company had two labels, so their sort of premier label, which actually was started in 1911, was called. His Master's Voice, HMV. Um, this had this very, very famous trademark of the dog, you know, looking into the, to the gramophone with the horn, you know. Um, they also, and, and those records sold for three shillings six. Then they had a slightly cheaper line, which is called Zonophone. The Zonophone record sold for three shillings. So all the South African material came out here, that came out, was, was issued on, on Zonophone. Okay, so then from 1912 to 1920, there was a total, a total hiatus of any, any recording done by South Africans. Um, you know, the World War came along in 1914, kind of interrupted stuff. Um, and then in 19, starting in 1920, you started getting this pattern again, where where Mackay Brothers was sending was sending you know artists to um, you know record in England for Gramophone Record Company. In the early twenties, the most the most uh, important recording was Saul Plyke made the first recording of Nkosa Sikulele for Gramophone Record Company in 1923. Then a ver another rather significant event was that. In 1928, there was a, um, a trio of Cape colored musicians led by a guy named Mac Jackson. They made records in the UK. Now, the interesting thing about that is, is that that is the first, oh, how can I put it, non-African 
vernacular music. In other words, though, you know, we'd had these 1912 recordings, which were like completely indigenous African material with no Western influence whatsoever. Now we have the first recordings of genuinely syncretic material. In other words, you know, it's a mixture of, of all kinds of different traditions mixed up in a, in a nice South African mixed masala. As a matter of fact, this, this, um, this material was at the time known as Tiki Dry. So that again, very significant. And at the same time, you know, uh, H, you know, um, uh, you know, gramophone record company and Mackay's, you know, they were sending, they were sending sort of, you know, Afrikaans semi-operatic singers like Jan van Sale over to record, etc., etc. So just to backtrack up a little bit in looking at the era of the 1920s. So one significant event was that in, in 1918, actually, Another company was started called Polyax, and Polyax ended up having the exclusive license for the Columbia label, Columbia Graphophone. Now, you know, in the early the early years of the of the of the record industry, you know, you had several companies that were like the majors of their era, but two of the most significant was definitely Gramophone Record Company with its sister company tie-in with, with Victor in America, and then Columbia Graphophone in, in England with their sister company ties to, to Columbia, the Columbia label in, in, in America. So, so that, was a, that turned out to later be a significant event, this tie-up between Polyax and Columbia Graphophone, but I'll get to that a little bit later. The other significant event was that in 1926, Eric Gallo got the exclusive license to import an American label called Brunswick. And he set up a, he actually set up a company called Brunswick Gramophone House. So that was the first direct tie with South Africa with an American record company. Previous to that, everything had been via England. I mean, just for example, again, in 1924, Edison Bell Winner, which was another you know, major English label at the time, they sent a field recording unit to Cape Town in 1924. Their local agents were Juta and Company, which later, you know, Juta and Company later became a major supplier of textbooks. But anyway, they had this, this license for Edison Bell Winter back in the 20s, and Edison Bell Winter sent this, um, this field unit down to, um, you know, down to uh, Cape Town in 1924. Recorded people that were basically connected with, with um, you know, the Cape Town Symphony Orchestra. So there wasn't much in the way of sort of South African vernacular music, although um, it was, the first recording of De Stem was actually made for Edison Bell Winter in 1924. Anyway, so then we come to the year 1930. So there was like a couple of very significant events. The first was that um, Gramophone Record Company and Mackay brothers sent Ruben Calusa's double quartet to the UK to record in London. And they ended up making something on the order of was about 130 recordings, which was like, I mean, this is major. This is like major. The second, this, the, the second significant uh, event was that after, after many years of just being the Columbia agents, Polyax finally got off their, you know, their whatevers. And, and for the first time in their existence, sponsored a, South, a, a field recording unit from Columbia Graphophone to actually come to South Africa and make recordings here. You know, uh, it was a, and actually quite fascinatingly, I mean, this was quite a newsworthy event. You can go back to the newspapers in 1930 and, you know, there was all this 
this, you know, starting in about January, February, there was all this publicity about, about you know, Polyax is now looking for artists, local artists who can make real South African, you know, music on, you know, for Columbia Graphophone when they, the, the field unit finally got out here in July. Uh, they came from, they, they had previously been making records in Turkey and then they came and they came down to, they came down to Cape Town and then went up to Johannesburg. Okay, so the third significant event of 1930 was that Eric Gallo, spur, actually Eric Gallo being a, 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 you know, a very sort of competitive sort, you know, so he's starting out this business and he's kind of competing against, you know, both Polyax and Mackay Brothers. I mean, they are the giants of the South African music retail industry and he's this kind of upstart who, you know, started out, like I say, importing this American label called Brunswick. So he, uh, you know, he, he actually obviously was reading all of these, you know, newspaper articles about how, hey, guess what? The Columbia Graphophone Field Unit is coming to South Africa and we're looking for local talent and da 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 So he said, well, okay, I'm gonna get one up on my competitors. So he ends up sending Afrikaans artists initially to, to um, record at a small company in England called Metropole and, and as a matter of fact, for the next two years, he ended up sending several batches, both Afrikaans and African artists. You know, the, you know, the, Afri the African artists were actually recruited by Griffiths, Griffiths Matsialoa. Griffiths would, is, was effectively the first African talent scout producer in South Africa. So, um, so there, you, there you have it. I mean. Like I say, 1930 was a seminal year. Now, you know, I've, it just occurs to me, I need to actually go back. And there is one aspect of the 1920s that I actually forgot to mention that's also quite significant. And that is that the first South African musician to become a major South African musical export and a guy who made dozens of records in the 1920s, albeit not in South Africa, was Len Phyllis. Len Phyllis was a guitarist, ban played banjo, Hawaiian guitar, and he made, he went, he went to, he was from Cape Town originally, he went to the UK sometime in the early 1920s and immediately established himself. He was like, he was the English go-to string player um, who made, like I say, made, made many records under his own name, but also made records with various of the various dance bands there, et cetera, et cetera. So you can say that like Len Phyllis was basically our first major South African recording artist. And then he was then followed up in the later 1920s by a, uh, a, a vocalist named Al Boley. Al Boley, Al Boley was actually born in Lorenzo Marcus, today, today's uh, Maputo, but grew up, grew up in, uh, grew up on the, on the, on the East Rand. And then um, in about 1927, he went overseas, initially to, to Germany, and then later to England and established himself as a, as a vocalist. And Although, you know, the major, the major success, I mean, Al Boley was, well, they used to call him the, the British Bing Crosby. He was incredibly, an incredibly popular uh, figure, albeit mostly in the 1930s. But there again, that would be, you could say that Al Boley was our second sort of prominent South African uh, musical export in terms of, you know, sort of international uh, connections. So, okay, so to get back to, to the developments of the 1930s. So, so um, a major, major development in the record industry internationally was that the Gramophone Record Company, 
and Columbia Graphophone, and there was a third company involved as well, um, they, because of the pressures of the Depression, these companies, which had formerly been sort of bitter rivals, came together and they formed a new company which is called you know, the Electrical and Musical Industries, EMI. And, and so in 1932 and early, late 32, early 33, the EMI combination, uh, which again, at that time, they still had, they still had poly, Polyax was still separately representing the Columbia label, Mackay Brothers still separately representing, you know, gramophone record company HMV. They, there was another, another field expedition, uh, recording field expedition that came down here and again, made another couple thousand recordings both in Cape Town and in Johannesburg. A lot of really interesting and, you know, you know musically, uh, you know, important material that was cut. All, incidentally, all African or Afrikaans, no English South African uh, uh, material. It, you know the the attitude the attitude until after the Second World War was that well, you know why, you know why should we record uh, South African English artists when we, you know we can just draw on these international catalogs that we that we can that we have the exclusive license to import into South Africa. But anyway. So, so then um, the other uh, significant development was that the Metropole Company that Eric Gallo had used to record, because Metropole was not only recording the material, but they had their own pressing plant. So they were, able, they were basically able to send the finished records, you know, back to South Africa. Um, uh, at the time, there were, there were no... You know, there were no, no pressing plants to actually, you know, press records here. So the Metropole went bankrupt. Again, it was a victim of the Depression. This was probably, probably early 1932. So here's Eric trying to develop a local catalog, and all of a sudden his go-to supplier of, you know, studio and pressing is is out of the picture. So, being quite adventurous and entrepreneurial, he goes to England. The first thing he does is that he goes and he buys Metropole's studio equipment, imports it into South Africa, together with the services of the Metropole recording engineer. It was a guy named John Hecht. So he goes, buys the stuff, brings it down to South Africa, and in probably August 1933, they finally get this studio going, and that is the first permanent recording facility in South Africa. As a matter of fact, it is the first permanent recording facility in sub-Saharan Africa. You know, I used to, I used to wonder, could it, could it have been the first recording, permanent recording facility in anywhere in Africa? But I only recently learned that in fact, there was a recording, a permanent recording facility that was set up in Cairo in about 1908. So you can say that the Gallo facility was the, second permanent recording facility, but nonetheless, the second, the second recording facility in Africa, the first recording facility in, in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa. So very, very significant development. Then the other thing that Gallo did was that he went and, and got a licensing and pressing arrangement with DECA. Decca Records. Decca Records had started up in the late 1920s, and by 19, by this time in the early 30s, they were already a seriously, a, a serious rival to both um, 
uh, you know, gramophone, well, with EMI and Edison Bell winner, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, this was a situation where not only was Decca pressing Gallo's studio recordings, because, you know, the, the, the recordings would be, would be cut. They were cut initially on wax masters. Uh, and then they would, they would be shipped to the UK uh, uh, DECA factory. The records would be pressed and then they'd, they'd be shipped back here. Uh, all on ships, incidentally. This is long before sort of international airline uh, uh, facilities were available. And, um, and then, of course, the other thing was that he then also had the exclusive license to bring DECA records into uh, into into the into South Africa, and and you know that actually established. Well, it actually continued a pattern that basically, and this is just looking forward into the development of the record industry here. Basically, it was impossible until at least the 1980s and probably the 1990s in this country, it was absolutely impossible for you to develop a record company of any sort of financial stability and long-term survival if you didn't have international licenses. You simply could not make a go of it here unless you unless you had, unless you were able to draw on international catalogs. Because, you know, the record, the record business and record companies, I mean, it's cyclical, you know. One day you've got a big hit, the next day your stuff isn't selling. But in the meantime, you still got to maintain all those overheads and pay your employees. So, so you had to have international licenses. That was, and you know, I mean, this of course, this international license story goes back to the very beginnings of the industry. But anyway, so that's one of the reasons why that DECA connection uh, was incredibly important in terms of, of Gallo's survival. So then the sort of the second, the second interesting development in the later 30s uh, was that, um, you know, the, the, the SABC, the South African Broadcasting Corporation had actually been created in 1936. Uh, prior to that, there had been four privately owned radio stations here. And in 36, the government basically passed legislation that effectively bought them out and nationalized the, the, the service. Um, and they all one of one of the one of the things that they did was that they built a very very expensive uh, facility called Broadcast House. It was on Commissioner Street. Uh, I think it was opened in 1938, and they had they they had a a very very modern recording studio built. First of all, obviously for their own, you know, they wanted to they wanted to be able to sort of pre-record material for broadcasts, but um, they also they also for a fee let um, let private companies record there. So Gallo started recording there, and and the 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 audio quality of the SABC recordings was much much better than Gallo's. Uh, recording facility. So you had this situation where, where um, uh, look, it was, <laughs> it, was a, it was a typical South African racial situation where, where the Afrikaans artists, who at that time were the real money spinners for Gallo, uh, this was the likes of the David Delongas and the Hendrix Hassans, would go to the SABC to record, whereas the African material was still recorded, and and some Afrikaans material as well was still uh, recorded at at um, at Gallo's studios, which by that time, by the late 30s, like 
the, f the, first, the first Gallo facility was in a building in Market Street. And then that was in, th that was in, in thir 1933. And then along about 1938, they then moved to the corner of Troy and um, Troy and Pritchard Street. Troy and, sorry, Troy and President. Troy and, co corner of Troy and President. And that was where they had this building that was about, initially it, initially it was about five or six stories with a recording uh, studio on the, t on, the, on the top floor. Um, and so there was another, you know, Gallo used the SABC facilities. There was another entrepreneur named Charles Berman who started recording Afrikaans material. He had a label called Concert. Um, and then there was a third studio that was built. It was called uh, the La. It was called Lafayette, the Lafayette Recording Studio, um, and um, it was actually started by a guy named Llewellyn Hughes. And right from the get-go, they well, they did record Afrikaans material, but they also recorded African material. The Afrikaans material came out on, mostly on a label called Tir, for Afrikaans for tiger. Um, and the African material came out on Better, the Better label. And uh, yeah, there's a, was right from the get-go, some extremely inter, for example, the, the one and only recording by the original Jazz Maniacs was made in either 39 or 40. For, for the better label. So that was the situation up to the start of the Second World War. Basically what happened was that the war came along. Um, the most immediate effect of it, well, it wasn't actually immediate, but along about nine, so the you know the war actually started in August thirty nine. By about nineteen forty one, the the British merchant marine, in other words, the commercial ships that were bringing, you know, South African, were, were bringing English products, including pressed records, to South Africa. The you know the Germans, the Germans were starting to knock out. The, uh, the the British Merchant Marine, so it was no longer uh, it was no longer possible for for uh, British manufactured records to come to South Africa. Um, better, uh, probably right from the get go, had actually set up. I think I'm not sure. I think Better actually had their own pressing plant right from the get go. And may have never ever used um, uh, the UK, but Gallo Gallo was Gallo was basically messed up. They they tried they tried to set up a, some sort of a primitive press, and they did put out some some um, uh, uh, you know rather crudely manufactured uh, records during the war, but you know they gave it up. So so basically you know. From, for the first half of the 1940s, there was very, very little uh, recording activity going on here. Um, and as a matter of fact, there, were, there was very, very, you know, records were like, during the war, were like a very scarce commodity here. They started, interestingly enough, uh, Gallo, Gallo started r importing records from India. So, you know, if you're a record collector here, you'll, you, you quite frequently find uh, 78s, Indian pressed uh, 78s here. Um, and I've, you know, I, uh, you know, Don Albert told me how he remembered during the war as a, as a kid, you know, records were rationed. You know, you'd kind of get in a, a, a there would, announcement would come out that there would be a new batch of imported records come in from India. And people would actually queue, but they were only allowed to buy, I don't know, they were only allowed to buy three or four records. And then it was the, it was the next, you know, that was, that was just how, how the, the industry was hobbled. 
So then the war ends and you start getting a further development. So one of the one of the most important developments was that in probably actually in 1945, even before the war had, had, had ended, the Lafayette outfit was sold by Llewellyn Hughes, was sold to Arthur Harris. And Harris almost immediately changed the name to True Tone. And his True Tone company became a very, very uh, major player, starting from the late 1940s. I mean, among other things, Harris was the first guy to record English South African artists, um, the most prominent of which was Dan Hill and a guy named Roy Martin, uh, who had a vocalist named Eve Boswell, who again, you know, became quite famous as a vocalist in South Africa and then went to the UK and was a very, very successful, um, you know, vocalist in the, in the 50s in, in, uh, in the UK. And um, Harris also uh, set up his own pressing plant in probably about 47, 48, uh, which was of, you know, the pressing quality immediately improved the, you know, the, the Lafayette, the Lafayette, you know, uh, pressings are, are quite frankly, they're some of the worst, they're some of the worst, uh, worst pressed records in, in recording history. You know, even if you get one that is mint, it's, it's a, it's a bloody disaster. I'm, 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 obviously part of the problem was, is that they couldn't, it was very, very difficult to get good, you know, good, uh, good material. Uh, uh, during during the war, but anyway, so so True Tone became a very very major player, and you know just kind of going forward, um, you know uh, True Tone um, in well True True Tone had an African artist because you know they they were developing they were develop they you know. I mean, Harris was hell of an entrepreneurial. So he, you know, he started out not only, you know, recording Afrikaans material and African material, but English material. And then, very significantly, in about 1951, um, he had an artist. It was a it was a vocal trio or quartet called the SS Brothers, and the main guy there was Strike Vilikazi, and Strike, then became this True Tone's first dedicated African talent scout producer. And of course, Strike, had, you know, in terms of the development of like African, African music, I mean, Strike's 20 year development of that, of that, um, uh, you know, um, African catalog basically from about 1953 onwards was incredibly significant. I mean, you know, just for example, he, it was Strike who, who uh, first recorded Spokes Mosciani and, you know, Spokes' first recording, Ace Blues, was a massive, massive seller. Uh, you know, I don't know, when we talk massive, perhaps could have been as much as 100,000 copies. We just don't know. There's no, no records, but I mean, this was, and, and of course, this was what spurred the whole penny whistle jive uh, boom, uh, which lasted basically throughout the rest of the 1950s into the early 1960s. Um, because, well, typical situation in the record industry was that, you know, if somebody all of a sudden had a, a, a big hit, the next thing you wanted to do, you wanted to find your own artist to, to sort of, you know, start, start competing, start competing in that market. Anyway, that's, that's just one of, one of strikes, one of strikes, you know, many, many landmarks. Anyway, oh, and I should also mention that, that, um, an, uh, gosh, another significant development when it comes to True Tone was that True Tone in 1953 
brought, started recording on tape, on tape masters, um, as opposed to cutting direct into a lacquer. Um, and I, I will go back a little bit about this issue of, of, the, of the gradual conversion from direct cut lacquers to, to, um, to recording on tape, I guess, a little bit later. But anyway, so that, that, that was, that's the true tone situation. So the other major development right after the war was that in 1946, Eric, Eric consolidated he basically Eric had Eric had three companies up to 1946. He had Brunswick Gramophone House. He had his own label, which was the Singer, the Singer record label, and it was like the Singer Gramophone Company. And then in 39, he had gone in on a 50-50 basis to start another company which was called Gramophone Record Company, GRC, with a guy named Arnold Galembo. So in 46, he gathered up these three companies and he created a corporate entity called Gallo Africa. And Gallo Africa actually, you know, was a publicly, you know, all, all those companies prior had been basically solely financed by by Gallo himself, or, well, the one in conjunction with Arnold Colombo was GRC. But in 46, in 46, you know, Gallo Africa was like a publicly listed company. In other words, you know, sold equity, raised market on the stock market. And almost immediately there was, there was an investment. And for, for one thing, you know, um, Gallo uh, spent money to sort of uh, Im improve the, the, uh, the quality of the studio. Um, he finally, in 49, got around to actually building a pressing plant. So this was, the, the, this was all the sort of like commercial, you know, uh, development that was, the, because, you know, all of a sudden he's getting, you know, private investment to sort of, you know, start, start building his, the Gallo Empire. Um, and uh, can also mention that, that, um, the, you know, I, I previously mentioned that, you know, Gallo's lab, record label was actually, was, was the singer label. And what happened was that sometime along about, I don't know, along about the time that Gallo Africa was being created, um, Gallo was actually involved in a trademark suit over the, over the name Singer because the Singer Sewing Machine Company which was a U.S. based company, but you know, an international distribution brand, et cetera, et cetera. They actually challenged, they actually challenged uh, Gallo's uh, use of, of Singer as a, as, a, as a trademark name. So that was the way that Gallo got around that was he created this new label called Gallatone. And, you know, if you, if you follow, the, it's, it was quite clever the way that they, that the, 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 the way that, that he, he transitioned it. Because, you know, it's funny, in, in trade, you know, record, record company labels actually did used to mean something. You know, they, they, were, they were an important part of the marketing of, commercial music if you had a successful label. So, and, and Singer, you know, Singer had been a very, very well established South African label. So how to transition it? So the first thing was that the records starting in about 47, this was, there was a transition period of about two years. So the label was then, was changed to Singer at the top and then Gallatone underneath. Then there was a second phase where Gallatone was on the top and Singer was on the bottom. And then finally, Singer was dropped entirely and from about 48, 49 onwards, it was strictly, it was, it was all Gallatone. So that was the beginning of the Gallatone label, which was, you know, was a prominent South African imprint well into the, 
you know, the early 1970s. Um, so let's just see now. So the, the other, the other uh, kind of interesting development was with Charlie Berman. So I would previously mentioned Charlie Berman started recording in the late 30s using the SABC as a recording facility uh, for his concert label. Then after the war, he continued recording Afrikaans material as concert, but he set up another label called BB or Batu Bantu that for, for African material. And, you know, um, Berman basically ended up losing his company. It's a very, very complex sort of corporate story. But, but, but anyway, he ended up losing his company in 1953. And it eventually got subsumed. It got its assets, its recorded assets got bought up by True Tone, by Arthur Harris at True Tone. But prior to that point, Berman created a really, really significant um, African catalog. Uh, it's funny, you know, the, 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 um, the, um, you know, the, the Afrikaans material that he, that he developed after the war wasn't, wasn't really particularly successful or, can I say, musically significant, but the African material, because, and not only was it South African, Charlie was, Charlie was, you know, was sending like portable field units to, you know, what was then the Rhodesias and Nyasaland, you know, what today's Zimbabwe, Zambia, and, and uh, Malawi. So, I mean, he had a, just an incredibly interesting and diverse, uh, uh, you know, uh, catalog. So that, so, okay, that kind of takes care of the, uh, you know, the 40s. Okay, so now getting into the 1950s. So the, the, in 19, either 49 or 50, there had been a, a small record label, which had been started up by a guy named uh, Gerard or Gerard Horvitz, or Horwitz, um, uh, called Audion. He had it for a couple of years. It was exclusively African material. And then he sold it on to three uh, Jewish businessmen. Um, uh, and they renamed the company Troubadour. This was now in 1951. And critically, 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 they, well, when, they, when Troubadour started out, they tried to start an Afrikaans label. I mean, actually, Troubadour, you know, the spelling is actually Afrikaans. But the, Afri the Afrikaans catalog was a flop. And after a couple of years, they just totally gave up on Afrikaans recordings. But critically and crucially, they'd hired in as a talent scout this guy named Cuthbert Matimba. Cuthbert Matimba was absolutely one of the greatest talent scout African producers, critically, critically important in the development of, of um, you know, of Afrikaans, of African, African music here. Um, the guy was an absolute genius. And on the back of his genius, Troubadour was an incredibly successful operation from a financial standpoint. As a matter of fact, the, the interesting thing about Troubadour was that, you know, I'd previously mentioned how the pattern in the South African record industry right up to the 1980s or 90s was that you could not sustain a record company here on local recordings alone. You had to have an international license to bring American and primarily American, but also British recordings in, in, into South Africa on a, on a licensed basis, on an exclusive licensed basis. Troubadour was the great exception. Troubadour, because of Cuthbert Matumba, made tons and tons of money for a good long 10 year period. Um, they didn't, they, they, they only, they only 
started getting a couple of American license deals going in about 62, 63. Uh, you know, I had labels like Scepter, which had Dion Warwick, for example. But prior to that, for a good 10 years, they had made buckets of money strictly on local product, which was an exception to the, a great exception to the rule. So that kind of takes care of Troubadour. Uh, and just, I'm sorry, I must ask a question there. Sure. Who are the, who are the artists that were main, the, the notable artists from Troubadour? Dorothy Masuka. And then, and then you had, you know, you had uh, Mabel Mafuya. You had, and, and you had this tremendous collection, you know, <laughs> see, part of, part of Cuthbert's, part of Cuthbert's genius was that he had a completely open door policy. That was the first thing. So you constantly had all of these other musos who were allegedly exclusively contracted to Gallo or EMI or whatever. You know, if they needed some, if they needed some Shabid money, they could knock on Cuthbert's door and Cuthbert, Come, come. Of course, you know, the stuff would be, would go out under a pseudonym, but, you know, so he, so he, he had, you know, Chris Ongaka, well, actually, you know, Chris Ongaka actually made records under his own name for Troubadour, so he was an incredibly important guy. Gideon Lamalo, uh, uh, you know, um, the, you know, uh, you know uh, Gideon never actually recorded under his own name for Troubadour. Um, I forget what he had a, he had a pseudonym I've just forgotten what it is. But anyway, yeah, so, so he, he, you know, Cuthbert, Cuthbert, one way or another, had the absolute cream of what were essentially, and this, of course, this is another thing that's so interesting about, about, the, about the South African, African recording industry at that time. And it's something that I only discovered years later from talking to musicians, but it turns out that for decades, the majority of recordings were actually made by a very small group of people who might have exclusive contracts with one company, but then were busy doing, you know, uh, uh, well, they used to call it chedans. Chedans. If you do a chedans session, that means that, you know, you might have an exclusive contract with EMI, but, you know, you're doing a chenant session for, well, I mean, you know, all, 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 the, all the producers, you know, you know, Strike, Strike used to do it, probably not, Gallo not so much, because Gallo, Gallo never really had, you know, after, uh, you know, after um, uh, Griffiths, Griffiths Monsiello had actually died in 49, then there was this other guy named Walter and Tlapo, but, you know, to a great degree, Gallo still kind of depended on, on, on white guys. Uh, you know, unlike unlike their other their other big rivals in, in, in the in the industry. Um, so so and of course, look. But the other the other thing was, and this was Cuthbert's other secret, was that he had a permanent staff of. Musicians, you know, okay, wouldn't have, you know, but it included the likes of, you know, the Mabel Mafuyas, but also, you know, like Intemi. Intemi Poliso, you know, made, he was, he was part, they were actually paid, they were paid like a weekly salary. They would come in in the morning, and if, if there wasn't anybody like a Dorothy that was, scheduled that day or maybe maybe Kippy didn't come in through the door looking through it for some beer money then they just all get together and start making their own recordings and and you know so that was that was also there was no other company no other South African record company that look all you know the strikes and then of course I haven't even talked about Rupert Popape but they had their their go-to session people on call and you know, as as did Gallo, um, and, in, and and frequently, you know, like in the case of Gallo, 
um, you know, the, the, the studio musicians, if there wasn't anything happening in the studio, they'd be having other jobs at Gallo. I mean, you know, for example, um, um, oh God, uh, name has just gone out of my mind. Uh, uh, you know, Jen, General Doozy, you know, Jen, Jen would be there ready to back up the Skylarks if they happened to be in the studio. But if there wasn't happening anything in the, in the studio that day, at least as far as African recordings were, were concerned, well then, you know, he had a job. What was Jen's job? Jen worked, I think he, I think Jen, yeah, Jen, Jen worked in the, you know, they had a record library or they, or maybe he was looking after the, the master tapes. No. Anyway, you know, so th that was, that was part of the, but only Troubadour actually had this, this set of musicians who were permanently employed, paid a weekly salary to actually just do nothing but make music. <laughs> So that was also part of that was also part of the secret. And then, of course, the other thing, the other thing where where Cuthbert, it, it, Cuthbert, you know, was just absolutely out there was that he he was the guy I think who sort of pioneered this system of mobiles, the mobile system. So you have to understand at that point there was almost there was very very little radio exposure. For African music. Okay, there was like an hour or two on a Thursday or something on the SABC's English service where, you know, you might get the Manhattan Brothers in to do a live session or something like that. But there was very, very little exposure and very little, very little opportunity for, for the SABC to actually be playing, you know, uh, you know, African commercial recordings other than the Zulu service. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, so, so, um, so what what Cuthbert did, and and uh, was that, you know, he'd be in the studio, and and so, and of course, Troubadour also had the advantage. Okay, the, they they were they were in a, a building in Woolater, which was a commercial suburb down in the southern suburbs of Johannesburg. So. The recording studio was, uh, was on the top floor, then there were the offices, but on the bottom they had their own pressing plant. So what would happen, you know, um, Cuthbert would record something one day, you know, during the day, and then he'd go and he'd take the tape, he'd get a test pressing, and then the next morning he would be in, his, in the mobile. Now the, the mobile was just, it was like a truck or a, you know, a, a van with a with a turntable and a and an amplifier and then a PA speaker mounted on the roof, and he would go down. He would go down to one of these you know railway stations, for example, and he'd be playing he'd be playing this music that that he, you know, and in, in some cases he might have only you know recorded like the day before, and. Customers, you know, his, his would-be customers would be getting off the train from Soweto and would hear this stuff. And the, the way the system worked was, it was so bloody clever was that, was that if, you, if you liked, if you liked what, what, what was being played on the mobile, you know, uh, they would then give you, they'd, you, you'd say, oh, hey, you know, I really, oh, I like that, I like that Dorothy Masuka record. So then what they would do is they would give you a slip with the catalog number. AFC 324 or whatever. And then you'd go to the record shop and you'd just give them, you'd give them the, the slip of paper and say, there you go. It was a, a, a wonderful system. So Cuthbert and, and frequently, I mean, you can see, you know, there was a situation where, where for a time um, you had, you had, um, uh, and I found this out from Mary Tobey because Mary was one. So you'd have Mary, Susan Gabashani, uh, uh, Dorothy, um, uh, Nancy Jacobs, Miriam. They all they all used to get on. They would all get on this train together, and traveling up from Soweto to to. Um, you know, to their various destinations at the various at the various uh, 
record company. So you'd have this situation where, where you know, Dorothy would go and she'd cut a song and it would be out on the market and then, and then Miriam would record the same song, but you know, Gallo is a little bit slow off the mark. So, so Miriam's recording would only be out a couple of weeks after, after Dorothy. So like I said, this, this was all just part of, you know, not only did Cuthbert have a, an incredibly keen ear, but, but he also, you know, I mean, he just, he was a, he was a, you could say he was a marketing genius. And so, and, 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 you know, the, the other major, major figure that I, that I haven't talked about was, was Rupert Bopape. Rupert Bopape was EMI's uh, talent scout from about 1953, 54 onwards. Um, and also just, you know, developed an incredibly important catalog, but, and I'm going to actually discuss EMI now, but just to say that, you know, when I interviewed Rupert, Rupert told me, he said, listen, I was always chasing Cuthbert's coattails. <laughs> and for a guy like Bopawi to tell you that, just again, just reinforces this thing about just what an incredibly critical figure that Matumba was. And I have, of course, just you know, bringing the, the story forward, unfortunately, Matumba was killed in an automobile accident in May 1965. And, and Troubadour, Troubadour lasted about another, well, basically the company was sold in 69. So when with, with, with Matumba out of there, then, then Troubadour's fortunes, you know, declined. They tried, you know, they first tried to bring Kid Margo in, uh, um, uh, Daniel Macubella was his real name. Uh, but he didn't work out as a producer, and then they had various other people. They did have these international labels. They also were trying to, you know, they start, had started to develop an Afrikaans catalog, which was fairly successful, and also an English pop catalog. They had Billy, B B Billy Forrest in as a, as, a, uh, as a pop producer, but, you know, ultimately, Troubadour was tickets after, after Cuthbert departed. So again, Okay, now going, getting back to this story about, 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 the, um, about the 1950s. So I'd mentioned that, that you had this creation of EMI and, uh, in 1931, and when EMI started out, you still had the two separate South African, you know, exclusive licensors. You had Mackay Brothers for, for, the, for HMV, Gramophone Record Company, and you had Polyax for Columbia. In about 1938 or 9, Mackay Brothers went bankrupt. So the entire EMI catalog then fell into Polyax hands. So in 1950, EMI and Polyax created a new company called EMI South Africa. It was basically 50% owned by Polyax and it was 50% owned by the parent company in, in, uh, in, in, in the UK. So um, they started out, they started out, they built a big, they built a, first of all, they built a pressing plant down in Steeldale and, and, you know, started kind of generally jacking up their their operations initially initially the guy that that was basically their talent scout producer was a man named Joe Nofel but Nofel never had anything to do with african recordings but he was able on the back of Nico Karstens to create right from the get go a very very profitable afrikaans uh, division and then like i say in about Ooh, in about '53, then they brought uh, they brought Rupert Rupert Bopape. Ru Rupert had actually been working for Charlie Berman, and then when Berman lost his company, uh, 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 Bopape went to went to EMI. And and um, the interesting thing about the about EMI is that is that unlike all of these other 
independent these these companies that were now created who all had their own studios EMI declined to actually build a studio which is I'm not exactly sure why that was what they did was that okay they had the pressing plant but when it came to actually recording their own material they used to use this independent company called, I think they were called uh, CRC. Uh, it was, um, I think it stood for something like Consolidated Radio Corporation. This was a company that was owned by a man, uh, an SABC connected guy named, named Michael Silver. And it was one of the companies that had actually been created um, uh, to service Springbok Radio. Springbok Radio was, you know, was started in 1950. Prior, you know, prior to that, you had you had you had the English service of the SABC, you had the Afrikaans service of the SABC, you had the Zulu service. But there were no, you know, there were no advertisements. In 1950, the SABC started up this this other this other division, which was called Springbok Radio. It was a commercial radio. In other words, you could run you could run adverts on on springbok radio which you couldn't do on the english service for example and and um uh, they uh you know there were these there were four companies that were basically set up charlie berman set up one of them anyway to to pre-record material and advertisements for springbok radio so emi used to use Mike Silver's studio, but Mike's, they were still, they didn't record on tape. They were still cutting direct to lacquer. And it was only in 1957 that EMI finally got around to building their own studio. And this was opposite Gallows at Troy and, um, 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 <laughs> no, no, the name's just gonna, um, not Troy and President, uh, uh, Pr Pritchard and Troy, Pritchard and Troy Street. So, so you had you had Gallo on the one corner, and opposite that you had Music House with EMI's recording studio on the top floor and the seventh floor. And this, of course, was the creation of Loafers Corner, because all of the mu all of the musos, um, you know, you know, African white would gather in the morning on this intersection and hope to be picked up for session work during the day. So, so that was, and, and so that, that's where, so from, you know, um, EMI, you know, continued obviously to play a very, very major role. I mean, look, they had, they had an, you know, they had an incredible, Incredibly significant and important uh, important catalog. Um, so that was, you know, that was a, a major development of the fifties. Then, the other the other interesting development in the in the fifties was the establishment of Teal. Now, this is actually quite a quite an interesting but complex story that has a lot to do with what was going on in the international industry, but how it ended up sort of directly um, affecting events in South Africa as far as the industry development was concerned here. So what had happened was that, you know, right from the basically the late 1890s, you had this the sister company situation between Victor and Gramophone Record Company and the two Columbias, the US Columbia and the American Columbia. And that sister company relationship had been maintained for a good 50 years. It was a situation where, you know, if, if, HM, if, something, if HMV recorded something in the UK, it would be it would be issued in America on Victor and vice versa, but the whole system started to break down. It's actually the first the first breakdown occurred in about fifty 
1954, Columbia Records US basically told EMI to go take a hike and they signed an exclusive licensing agreement with Philips. Philips being a Dutch, an up and coming Dutch company that had been established after the Second World War. So the next, the next thing that happened was that, you know, the American companies had, had, had always kind of, they had this relationship with EMI, which was long and historic, but it was kind of like, hey, you know, we're in our territory and, you know, you've got your territory. The whole apple cart got upset in either 55 or 56, I think it was actually 55, when EMI bought a very, very important American label called Capital Records. The minute EMI invaded American territory, Columbia and, R well, Victor, but it was now, R Victor, B Victor Talking Machine became RCA Victor in 1929 when the Radio Corporation of America bought Victor Talking Machine. Anyway, so, so in response to, to this, um, Columbia broke off their relationship with Philips and they established this, the CBS label specifically to, to, um, specifically to service all of these international markets, including South Africa. So Polyax, Polyax that actually had the C, you know, the Columbia CBS catalog, um, even, even, you know, actually, no, they'd, they'd actually already, they'd actually already lost it to, to, to Phillips. But in any event, um, they, they, and they, they went to Columbia and, uh, you know, uh, the GRC division of Gallo went to Columbia and said, let us, let us be your, your representative here, I excuse, and they said yes. So from 56 onwards, the CBS label was actually subsumed into the Gramophone Record Company division of Gallo Africa. And interestingly enough, you know, GRC had, had been recording African material, but their catalog had really gone south and and, and had, in, as a matter of fact in you know by by you know they 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 had basically given up on on kind of african recordings by by the early 1960s and uh when cb so eventually what happened was that Geez, I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm, I'm now I've gotten gotten ahead of myself in this in this complex evolution. But but what what happened was is that was that initially, CB the, the CBS label became an exclusive licensee to the Gramophone Record Company division of of Gallo. About ten years later, in '67, uh, Gallo formed a JV with Columbia under GRC. And from 67 onwards, the Columbia CBS label, which would eventually become Sony, was a, was a joint venture, 50% owned by Gallo Africa, 50% owned by, by Columbia CBS in the States. And when, the, in about 64, 65, GRC, they had, they did, they, they'd always had African labels and materials, but they basically dwindled. And at the time that this JV was actually set up, GRC was no longer recording any African music. And one of the conditions of the new JV was that they were, GRC was instructed to start recording African music again. And it was at this point that 
they created this what was at the time a very the famous blue label CBS African series and they brought Hamilton and Zamande over from EMI to become become the the you know the African talent scout producer this was now the beginning of you know again Hamilton ended up recording an incredibly important catalog you know it was basically known as it's a bias uh, you know I mean Hamilton was just again one of the major, major uh, figures in, in, uh, in the development of, you know, local African catalog. But now, okay, so now just going back, going back to the 1950s. So, so, and this whole, this whole change around. So, so Polyacs, Polyacs gained capital because GRC, GRC had previously had capital. So now Polyax has got capital, they've lost, they've, but they've lost CBS, and they're about to lose RCA as well. But instead what they did, they went to RCA and they said, listen, we've got this subsidiary company called Teal. Now, Teal actually was an acronym that stood for, it's funny, I was, this morning I was trying to, go into my files to remember a, it was something like telecommunications electronics limited africa or something like that it was a name like that but abbreviated teal so polyax basically went and they said listen we've got this subsidiary company that's called teal why don't you you know we understand how you're extremely pissed off with with emi and and uh, and, and 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 polyax who are now in a JV partnership, but you know, would what would you consider, you know, licensing RCA through through this subsidiary company? So yeah, RCA RCA said yes. So you had effectively this, and and you know, I'm not exactly sure what the connection financially was, but Teal was basically a, an offspring, you know. Teal had actually been started in the late 40s, and it was a sort of a, you know, it was an electronic supply company, but they had this side business, you know, way, way back before, you know, even uh, certainly, but way before video, but even before, you know, you used to have sort of, you know, you know home cameras, uh, people, you know, if people had a bar mitzvah or they had a wedding, they would hire a mobile recording company to come and record the wedding, and then they'd they'd cut they'd cut a couple lacquers for you, and this was like a souvenir of your event. Teal was in that business as well, so there was a marginal connection with recording. But basically, what happened was that they started out in '56, um, and thanks to that RCA, that critical critical RCA. Uh, uh, you know, licensing connection, they hit gold immediately with Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley was massively popular in this country. So, first of all, the, you know, Teal, Teal's financial success was guaranteed right there. But, and also, of course, they, had, they now had access to the RCA Victor catalog, which, you know, in the late, the late 50s, early 60s, I mean, RCA Victor was you know one of the you could say it was almost i wouldn't want to say the giant of the u.s industry but certainly one of the two or three massively so so they had this catalog they tried and again it's quite interesting they tried to develop an afrikaans catalog it just absolutely went south nowhere but they hired this guy named labenya labenya matloko who uh, you know his he was, he was married to this woman named Sylvia Malloy, who also had big connections with the SABC. Anyway, Labenya started to develop a very, very successful, you know, Afri you know African uh, catalog. So that's the beginning of Teal from, from 56 onwards. So that's probably, you know, look, in the 50s, you still, you, there were other attempts to start 
record companies. You know, there was this outfit called USA, <laughs> which was not USA at all. It was actually started, a guy, the guy's name was Michael Kidamaster. Uh, he, and he, he was an Englishman, but he was working for uh, what was then the Central African Broadcasting Corp up in Lusaka. And then in, he left, he, you know, he, he, he left them and he came down and he tried to start his own company called USA Records, which again lasted a couple of years. He, he ended up selling the, he ended up selling the, the company to Gallo. And Gallo, Gallo continued issuing stuff on the USA imprint for a good 10, 15 years, you know, good 10, 15 years afterwards. But basically, you know, there were, you know, the companies that I've mentioned, the Troubadours, the Teals, and so forth, they, you know, they were, they were the survivors. And of course, you know, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Berman's BB company, uh, bit 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 the dust as well. So so then you get to the 1960s. The 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 two probably most significant event of the 60s. Actually, the one thing I should actually go back to is also is quite an interesting story. Is the the story of of how there was this gradual conversion from recording direct to lacquer. Um, you know, the lacquers had actually replaced wax masters back in, back in the day. But anyway, uh, you know, starting in the late, you know, the development of recording technology based around tape had actually started after the Second World War. The, the, the invention, the, actually the, the invention of the quarter inch, you know, recording, recording on quarter inch tape. That was, that was a technology that was developed by the Germans in the Second World War. And then after the war, uh, the Americans basically took those, took those, took those machines uh, from Germany to the States and then, you know, took, took the German machines apart and then started making their own machines. The, the, the company that was the, the prominent leader in this was called Ampex. So, so basically from the late 1940s onwards, you start getting this conversion, at least in America, of you know, recording, recording, uh, recording on tape. Um, a little bit slower process here in South Africa. The, f <laughs> the first the first tape machine to be imported into South Africa was imported by Gallo for Hugh Tracy. Again, you know, the whole, the whole Hugh Tracy saga, I suppose, you know, um, uh, should be, uh, needs to be discussed. But basically, you know, Gallo, Gallo, Tracy was a Gallo employee. And Tracy convinced Eric Gallo that there was going to be money to be made if he could set if he could have a mobile recording situation with with this imported EMI uh, you know tape recorder in the back of a Land Rover and if they go out into the rest of Africa and make you know and and, and make commercial recordings so that's the first one then Charlie Berman Charlie Berman is the second guy he recorded, started recording on tape in 51. True Tone followed in 53. In 54, Hugh Tracy left Gallo's employ in 1954 and set up the International Library of African Music. So he's no longer a Gallo employee, although very, very connected to Gallo, you know. Uh, Gallo was, you know, there was, to set up ILAM, International Library of African Music, there was definitely, I think, you know, the Ford Foundation, for example, was a, was a donor to this, which was now going to be like this pan-African, or at least pan-sub-African, sub-South Africa, you know, sub-Saharan African uh, operation, uh, as opposed to just, you know, sort of concentrating somewhat on a somewhat more limited geographical basis. And, and um, Gallo was still very, very supportive, uh, 
Um, and, you know, for example, ILAM's offices were located at Gallo's uh, pressing plant uh, that they'd built in, in, in 49. But um, when, when, he, when Hugh left to form ILAM, Gallo's studio then took over that, that Emmy, uh, you know, the EMI recording machine. So that was the beginning of Gallo recording on tape in 54. The old, the old man, EMI, only started recording on tape in 57 when they finally built, uh, you know, when they finally built uh, Music House, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, Troy and, Troy and Pritchard Street. Um, anyway, so let's see now, just getting back into the 60s. So, so I've already previously mentioned how the GRC division of Gallo ended up as a JV GRC division, 50% owned by GRC, 50% owned by, by, um, 50% owned by, 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 Gal, uh, by the parent company, the CBS company, Columbia, which would eventually become Sony in the 1980s sometime. So then you had this parallel development. So after a short period of time where Philips, Philips was a Dutch company, and Philips had actually tried, actually Philips tried to set up their own wholly owned independent division uh, in South Africa along about 1953-54. It only lasted a couple of years. And True Tone ended up with the Philips license. So there was a very, very close association with Philips. So then in, 50, in 1964, Arthur Harris sold True Tone to Gallo. True Tone thereafter became a Gallo Africa company. Now, in the meantime, Gallo, in addition to having their DECA UK, you know, best booty uh, connection, which had gone back to 1933, they had also established a connection with, a, with another important international company, which was called Polydor. Polydor was a Polydor was a German company whose, pro, you know, they had a big German local catalog, but, but the, the, the real wealth of, of, of Polydor was in the Deutsche Grammophon label, which was like quite probably, it was certainly one of the pres, most prestigious classical music labels of its time. At an, in an era when selling classical music was still big business, unlike today. So, so Gallo from the early 50s had this Polydor connection. So then what happened was that in the late 1950s, Polydor, Polydor Germany and Philips Holland merged to become Phonogram. It was Phonogram and Phonogram and eventually the name Phonogram changed to Polygram, you know, I think sometime in the 1970s, if I remember correctly. But anyway, so in 67, at the same time that Gallo's doing this JV arrangement, you know, with uh, CVS and, and their, and their um, you know, GRC division, they end up doing a JV with Polygram, with, yeah, with, uh, um, Phonogram, with phonogram. It was still phonogram in 67. Again, 50% owned, and, and they, they used the True Tone division. So it was officially True Tone, owned 50%, and phonogram owned the other 50%. Now that is the root of what is today's universal. But yeah, <laughs> this is just how, but anyway, to, that's, that's getting a little bit ahead of the story. So, so again, so, you know, in the, by the 1960s, you know, you had, 
this ever-expanding industry. As a matter of fact, just just here's a here is an interesting an interesting little sidebar was that <laughs> Oh, okay, cool. Make it yeah, we'll make it South African. So so here's a little here's an interesting sidebar to just give you a gauge of just how big and successful this industry had become even by 1959. So you know I mentioned that that you know Eric had this long-standing connection with DECA. And DECA was headed by a, a guy who became a very, very famous figure in the British recording industry, a guy named Edward Lewis, actually who later became Sir Edward Lewis. He was, he was the head of DECA, had started DECA in the late 20s. And DECA, like I say, became a major, major company like, you know, you know, on the order of an EMI or something. And, but um, Ted, Ted Lewis to his friends, Ted and Eric were, were best buddies. And in 1959, Eric invited Ted Lewis to come down to South Africa on a visit, but, but Eric threw a big party for Edward Lewis and invited all the, all the important people of the South African record industry and probably the broadcasting people as well to come to this, this, you know, this fairly large group of people, and obviously all male, needless to say, all white, needless to say, but nonetheless. Anyway, so Edward Lewis gives this speech before these people of which I have a copy. And one of the things that Edward Lewis says and again, how he arrived at this, I don't know. But he claimed that South Africans were, on a per capita basis, were the, were the biggest record purchasers in the world. <laughs> so again, I have no idea how he would have got that statistic, but nonetheless, it actually shows you, you know, even by the late 1950s, how successful you know the the industry actually was here but anyway that's a little bit of a diversion so sort of working our way up through the up through you know they, i think i've kind of basically i've basically covered the 60s so then okay in the 70s in the 70s well first of all in the 70s you started getting other fairly successful indie companies that were able to actually come along and and survive quite nicely. One of them, for example, was CTV, uh, led by Morris Horowitz, which later became Music Team. And and you know, they had a, you know, CTV Music Team had a good good 30-year run, uh, maybe a little longer from the from the 60s. Ag again, you know, not only developed an important local catalog and very successful, but you know, had a lot of, you know, a lot of international uh, licenses of import. Another interesting development was that in 60, in 67, three individuals who had been closely associated and critically associated with, with uh, the GRC uh, division of Gallo Dan Hill, who was the musical director. Um, um, oh, damn. Um, uh, Matt Mann, Matt Mann, who was their marketing guy. And Jeff Tucker, who was their ace engineer. The three of them left GRC to start their own company, which was called RPM. And Everybody in the industry apparently predicted that they were going to last about two months, but remarkably enough, they survived and prospered. Again, no doubt critically, because very, very early on, perhaps as early as about 69, maybe even earlier actually, they got the license for A&M Records in the States. So again, it was just part of that old rule of thumb. If you could get, if you could 
latch on to a good international license, then then you know your company would have a would have a, a you know a, a successful chance of a of a good run of of uh, profitability and survival. And you know of course RPM then went on to to create both you know important you know white pop catalogs. Uh, uh, African catalogs um, and Afrikaans, so you know they were a major player. Eventually, eventually they 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 did sell out uh, to to Gallo. Um, they sold out in nineteen eighty one, I think, eighty one or eighty two, um, uh, and then. Thereafter, it became, you know, it was the RPM division of, of, of Gallo Africa. Um, so then the other rather uh, critical and interesting uh, development was that in 76, the arch rivals um, of Teal and Gallo Africa merged. Now this, you know, um, Gallo, of course, it always, Gallo Africa, I mean, you know, Eric Gallo was like, I don't know, there's, there's just no equivalent figure in the industry today to match an Eric Gallo. I mean, he was, you know, just this incredibly, you know, charismatic, Guy who developed this in this in this incredible business, you know, people, you know, people. It's a it's a funny thing, you know. Uh, Gallo, Gallo paid its employees poorly compared to other other people in the industry, and yet people wanted to work for Gallo simply because of the prestige of being associated with Eric Gallo is quite quite remarkable. Teal, on the other hand, was led by a guy named Gerald McGraw. And McGraw's legacy, mm, somewhat, um, uh, look, er, you know, Gerald McGraw was not an honest person. I mean, that's just, you know, er, Gerald McGraw ripped a lot of people off. And, and he had, um, he and he and Eric were known to dislike each other. You know, it was literally they didn't want to be seen on the same side of the street together. So, but financial circumstances basically forced them into this merger. First of all, Gallo's operations were just sort of undergoing one of their sort of periodic downturns. This is part of the business. And of course, this was on the back of the 76 riots and, and you know, financial conditions here were not good. Uh, McGraw, and again, it's just, uh, it's too complicated a story, but basically McGraw was facing a, a foreign buyout that would have actually displaced him from his position as, as the, at the top of the, the teal uh, pyramid. So he also had a reason to, to, come, to come together. So yeah, in, 70, in 76, Teal and Gallo merged. And thereafter, you had the, the three main divisions you had RPM, you had Gallo GRC, and then you had Teal True Tone. And again, Teal True Tone ended up with that 50% JV with phonogram, which had now become polygram. Now, another interesting development, and this probably also had an effect on making uh, McGraw sort of uh, kiss and make up with, uh, with Eric was that 
McGraw had suffered a rare misfortune several years earlier. And that misfortune was that, that it, was really <laughs> it was really one of the few times that Gerald got a, got a, got a, got a touch of his own medicine. He had, you know, at the time, Teal had the, Teal had the license for, for Warner, Warner Electra Atlantic. As a matter of fact, they had, had, they had actually had the Atlantic license from the, from the, early, from the early 60s. Uh, they, they had managed to grab it from Gallo, actually. Gallo originally had it, and then, then they lost it to, lost it to Teal. So he brought, so Gerald brought this, uh, this English executive, uh, Derek Hannon, who had been working at EMI in the UK, he, he, brought, he brought Hannon down to run the WIA licensing division of Teal. So what happened? Oh, WIA, Warner Electra Atlantic which again was a conglomeration in the states of what had originally been, there was a Warner Brothers label, there was an, an Elector label, there was an Atlantic label, and there was the, the you know, Frank's, uh, the, the Reprise label was part of the package as well. Reprise had been a company that had been started by Frank Sinatra, and then Sinatra sold out basically to, at some point, to the, so, that, so that, that's WIA. We are Warner Electra Atlantic. So, so Derek Hannon, and this was, pro and no doubt, I'm sure that Teal paid for the trip. Derek Hannon goes to Wea in New York and says, "Hey, listen, why are you guys doing business with this bloody, you know, this crook Gerald McGraw? You know, why don't you just set up a wholly owned Wea division in South Africa and I'll run it for you." And we agreed. I mean, you can just imagine. I mean, I've I've heard stories about how you know, you know, Gerald McGraw was just, you know, like I say, he was he was absolutely livid. But anyway, that was the beginning. That was the beginning of WIA South Africa, which was a wholly owned company by the U.S. WIA company. Until, and again, we're sort of fast forwarding, in about 1983 or four, we uh, got, started getting extremely uncomfortable about having it known that they were still doing business directly in South Africa. Because remember now, this is, this is now the time when, you know, the, you know, the cultural boycott and all this stuff is really starting to heat up. And Wea was worried about the political fallout that might obtain from, from them being seen to be doing business directly in South Africa. And again, just going back to those JV arrangements that I t spoke about before, which was the Teal True Tone Polygram JV and the Columbia Records soon to be, well, eventually to be Sony GRC connection. You know, even in 67, I suspect, I suspect that one of the reasons why those two foreign companies wanted to get into these JVs, they still wanted to do business in South Africa. But you know, even in 67, South Africa was becoming a little bit problematic. So this was, a very, very effective way that they could continue to reap all the benefits of being in South Africa without being directly implicated if, unless somebody started looking too closely at the situation. So what happened with WIA was that in about 83, 84, the heat was just getting too hot for them. So they ended up, they ended up selling the company to the employees. And that was subsequently renamed Tusk. So that's where Tusk comes in. And of course, Tusk, Tusk was an independent company until 1997. Because 
What had happened? Now, again, one of the themes I've tried to develop here is the fact that it was incredibly difficult to do business in this country as a record company if you didn't have international licenses. So, what had happened was that come 1994, Gallo had lost, Gallo lost Sony. The minute, the minute you had independence here, Sony said, oh, why do we need these South African guys? Let's just set up our own wholly owned division. And that's exactly what they did. They did it within a very, very short space of time. And that was the beginning of what is now Sony South Africa. Like I say, the name, the name Columbia, Sony, I think, had, I think Sony bought Columbia CBS in about 86 or 87 or thereabouts. But anyway, so this was, this was obviously a decision on the part of, of Sony. The other JV, which was with what was by that time Polygram, they took a somewhat different, they took a, a little bit of a different course. They, they wanted to divest themselves of the Gallo connection, but they did it over a much longer period of time. And basically, you know, from like, it had been a 50-50 between Gallo Africa and, and, um, and Polygram and administered, it had, it had been administered, you know, through the Teal True Tone division of Gallo Africa. So what they did was that there was this interim period, there were several interim periods. So, the, you know, it, it started out at 50-50, which it had been since 1967. Then for like two years, it was like 60-40, and then it was 30-70. And finally, finally in about, I guess, I think it was 2001, it was already down to like sort of 1090, and then that was that was the that was the end of the the connection, and and so in 1990, basically in 1997, Gallo Gallo found itself without any international licenses. I mean, some of the uh, some of the other licenses, for example, Gallo via RPM had had had, had the Virgin license. But they lost Virgin when Branson sold Virgin to EMI so that he could finance his airline. So Gallo had lost that connection. And, and also, there had been this, there had been this, you know, international consolidation of labels. Polygram in particular was voraciously eating up all of these formerly, you know, major companies and subsuming them into Polygram. I mean, so it included, you know, everything from UK DECA to Island to Motown to A&M, you know, it went on and on and on. This was now all part of Polygram. And when Polygram was pulling the plug with Gallo, that meant that Gallo had lost had lost all of those international licenses. I mean, the interesting thing about it is actually that when I joined Gallo in 1990, Gallo Africa controlled every major label in the world except for the Warner Group and EMI. And I don't think there was any place anywhere else in the world where you had one company that had such a vast percentage of all the world's major catalogs. But after the early 90s, and particularly after, after 94 here, it all started falling apart. And in 97, Gallo found itself without, without, any, without any, any international labels. And they looked around and said, well, where can we buy one? The only EMI was out of the question. The only one left was Tusk. So that's why they went and they bought Tusk, because obviously via Tusk, they still had access to WIA, the WIA catalog. And they bought Shea Sound. Well, that was much, much, much later. They, you know, they only, look, they bought, per, they bought, 
They bought Shear and they bought Bula. It must have been some time in about, you see, I wasn't working for Gallo then. I was persona non grata at Gallo at that point. I think it must have been about 2014 or 2015, I think. And in CCP? Well, okay, CCP is an interesting, gosh, no, you see, that's interesting. Okay, CCP, CCP, Clive Calder Productions. Calder was a musician and a bass player, actually. Um, and he started producing records. He actually started producing records for EMI in the late 60s. And then in the early 70s, he started his own company, CCP. His first label was the Bullet Label and, and, and Little Giant. Little Giant and Bullet. Those were his two, his two imprints. And yeah, he developed a very, very successful catalog. I mean, he was the first guy that was actually able to bring um, uh, colored musicians into the pop mainstream with people like Richard John Smith was the, was the big one. But you know, you had people like little Ronnie Joyce and so forth. Um, so, and then in 19, in 70, I think it was, as a matter of fact, it was, I'm sure it was, it was in 76 and I'm sure it was a, it was probably a direct result of the, of the Soweto, uh, you, you know, uprising that um, he, he went and he, um, he, he, well, he sold, he sold, he sold Clive Calder Productions, CCP, he sold it to EMI outright, okay? And then he went to England and started, what was his first company called Zamba, I think. And of course, he immediately hit gold there with, with Billy Ocean. And then, you know, he went on to, Oh, you know, he developed uh, Britney Spears and the Black Street Boys, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, you know, a major, a major, a major figure. But ha and, and he, you know, he also, he continued to have, he continued to have South African uh, connections as well. Uh, even after he went, he went to the UK, um, he had, he ended up with this company called Priority. He, he owned Priority and then he, and then he, of course, Priority also eventually got sold to EMI. Well, so, so Tracy, Tracy was a, Tracy was a, you know, an Englishman who had a brother who had a tobacco farm in what was then Southern Rhodesia, today's Zimbabwe. I think he came down when he was either a teenager or maybe in his early 20s. Anyway, it was at that point that, um, you know, he became really, really enthralled with the you know, the local indigenous music of pro probably the African workers who are working on, on his brother's tobacco farm. So uh, in 1930, uh, when Columbia Graphophone sent this field unit to South Africa that was making recordings in Cape Town and Johannesburg, I don't know how the, if, how the connection was affected because um, you know, all of the artists that were recruited were basically recruited via Polyax. So I don't know, maybe maybe Tracy wrote to Polyax or whatever after reading reports in the newspaper about how this recording unit was coming down and, you know, and the newspaper articles started appearing in about February. The recording unit came here in July. Anyway, he brought a whole group of Zimbabwean musicians and they made records in 1930, which came out on, you know, Columbia, Columbia, the Columbia product came out on both the Columbia labels and on Regal. Regal, Regal records cost three shillings, Columbia's cost three shillings six. So this stuff that he recorded was all, was all uh, issued on Regal. And then when the next recording expedition came down, which was recording at that point was, was recording for both Columbia and uh, HMV, because by this time now it was a, it was EMI. Uh, the two companies had merged. Um, he brought down more musicians, and there were more recordings that were made. Like I say, it was late '32, early '33. So then the next interesting development was that um, you know I've mentioned how uh, 
the SABC was recorded, uh, was, the SABC was, was basically uh, founded by legislation in 36. And they immediately started, they had an English service, they had an Afrikaans service, and interestingly enough, they also um, started a Zulu service. And they brought Hugh down, I think in 37, to run the Zulu service of the SABC. And he worked there until 1946. In 46, that's when he was actually hired by Gallo, by Eric Gallo. I've even, you know, I, I've even, I even have a, I even have a, uh, a, a, a document where Gallo, Gallo is, is got all the names of his exec, of his executive team and who he's paying what, you know, monthly. So Tracy, and as a matter of fact, there was a, there was a, there was an internal division of Gallo Africa that was created specifically run by Hugh, which was called African Musical Research. And, and you know, the, uh, uh, look, you know, Eric, Eric was a businessman. Eric was not a musicologist. <laughs> Eric was a businessman, but somehow Hugh had convinced him that there was money to be made if they could, if they could, you know, go go into the rest of Africa and make make recordings I mean part part of the idea and and again I've I have I have actually you know when before Eric died he gave me all of his files so I've got all these internal memos between uh, these memos that Hugh actually wrote uh, you know to 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 Eric and and part of the part of the come on was that they were going to be able to sell these recordings to the mine compounds to play, to sort of, you know, keep the natives happy. Um, because, of course, obviously there was this incredible international contingent of workers in those days that were being drawn from all over the southern, you know, southern part of the continent that were coming down here to, to work in the mines. And so that was the, yeah, that was the beginning of his, of his, uh, of his involvement, you know, he. The interesting thing about it is, is that that um, all of all of his important out of South Africa recording expeditions, if you want to call them, which went as far on the west side of Africa, went as far as Katanga in southern Congo, and on the eastern side of the continent, went up to as far as Uganda. Um, all of that. All of those were 100% paid by Gallo, and as a matter of fact, were, the recordings were, initi were initially issued as commercial 78s, you know, um, you know, by, you know, uh, by Gallo, and some of them were also issued with the by, via the the GRC division as well, and and um, after 54, so in 54, he basically leaves Gallo's direct employee, starts the International Library of African Music. He only made one significant out of South Africa recording expedition after that. In 56, he went to what was then the Rhodesias. We, we, so he made some recordings in, in, uh, in Zambia and Zimbabwe, and there, and which, which for all I know, Gallo might have even paid for those. I'm not exactly sure. But anyway, the, the, the interesting thing is, is that, um, you know, after that point, after that point, he did, Tracy made one more significant group of recordings. He recorded Princess Magogo in 1974. And, and um, but here, here's the thing is that to this day, the International Library of African Music absolutely does not recognize that there was any Gallo involvement in the creation of the, if the art, you know, if you, if you ask them, you say, oh, 
you know, well, who, who, who actually paid for those extras? Oh, it was the Ford Foundation. Well, actually, the Ford Foundation only came into the picture with the founding of ILAM. So it, you know, it's, it's a, quite, a, quite an interesting case of historical denial, but anyway. <laughs> So you want to so you want to know something about what the what's the what's record the future of recording here? Yes. The I I the tra, the tra, what can I say the the traditional recording industry as it has basically existed since the 1890s is no more. Streaming has absolutely upended the financial model. Now, depending on your position, um, this you, you might consider this to be a good, a good or a bad thing. I personally think it's a tragedy. If you speak to the average academic who, you know, hate thinks record companies are a product of the devil and, you know, capitalism is evil, wada, 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 which is the usual line from these people. Oh, they think, oh, well, it's just great, you know. But here is the economic reality. Streaming pays so little that unless you are working in some sort of generic space which has at least the potential of creating gazillions of streams you can't make money that you can't even recover your production costs and it is for this precise reason that that first of all it means that that the comp well the many of the companies simply just aren't making any recordings at all but it also means that any sort of non-mainstream pop music, again, the stuff that's got the potential to get, you know, like Beyonce's 20 billion streams or whatever the hell it is, forget it. Nobody's going to invest money. So, okay, you know, individual musos may still want to record because they, rec they regard it as a marketing tool to get, because how does a musician make money now? Well, you can't make money out of recording unless you're Beyonce, I suppose. So you got to get, the only thing is you got to get, you got to get bums in seats. So one way to get bums in seats is to actually make a recording, you know, get it onto social media, et cetera, et cetera. So there you have a bit of financial logic. But as far as companies going out, the traditional methodology of going out, finding new artists who potentially are gonna be commercially successful, it's dead. And I don't see that it'll ever come back.